Okay. Did it just recently mute or? Okay, um, so you guys got, you guys got everything <laughs> up so until like, saying it's not recording. <laughs> like 30, 30 seconds ago, you got, I, I muted because there were a lot of people that were unmuted, so. Oh, muted. okay. Okay. Um, so graduation date holds, hopefully we'll get those figured out and we won't have too many more issues with that in the future. Um, but for now, we just have to, I guess, deal with all the issues that are created by the UC application and hopefully things will just continue to get better. Um, I'm gonna skip over concurrent on campus procedures real quick and just go Canvas issues. So you guys got my email about the Canvas issues. It's, they're working on a permanent fix. Um, you shouldn't have any issues now because the classes you know, have started. Um, that, that was on the 17th, um, but until they get a, a more permanent fix for this, it's gonna be an issue for, for teachers. So just make sure if they come to you saying they can't get their grades in on Canvas, they have to go into my SLCC. Um, I've had a couple of reports that um, one of the liaisons told them my CE, they cannot put grades in my CE, it has to be my SLCC. <laughs> um, just so you're aware. And as far as students getting access, I mean, their temporary fix seems to be helping. Um, it just, you know, every time a student registers or drops or I change a teacher or anything that is changed on that class at all in our banner information, our student information system, um, it reverts it back to that old date, you know, and so they don't have access until, until it says the classes start. So that's, that's hopefully they'll have a permanent fix before next spring. Um, fall really isn't an issue as far as starting classes, but um, spring tends to be, I, I can't overlap when spring starts and when fall ends. So um, it just really messes things up. Um, so hopefully they'll have a fix for that. And as soon as they do, I will let you guys know. Just be aware that that is an issue. Um, for Lisa over there at Brighton, it's gonna be a bigger issue for you. So give me a call when you get a second and we'll kind of talk it through. And then I'm gonna have Brandon go ahead and go over the new concurrent on campus procedures. Okay, um, before we do that, just uh, I wanted to, so we had an issue this morning with registration. Um, Becky, did you ever hear back if that had been resolved? I didn't, but I just talked to Tim and he was able to get some uh, students registered this afternoon. So it seems to be working now. Okay. But, okay. but we had, we had I, I pretty much um, all students were not able to register this morning, right? Because of the, the they had put a wrong date on the, uh, on the term or something like that. But that sounds like it's fixed. So hopefully if you've had students that are freaking out this morning because they can't get registered, they should be able to register now. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go over some changes to concurrent on campus coming up for fall 2024. Um, let me just give you a little background on what is uh, uh, sort of sparked these changes. The So I think it was earlier this year the, there were some updates within Canvas, I believe, that basically limited our ability to do what, what we call cross-listing, which is the ability to have one course and make it available to sort of two groups of students, so both concurrent students and our traditional adult students. And so when that change happened, they we, we discovered that, that cross-listing was no longer going to be an option, which is the way that uh, concurrent enrollment or concurrent on campus is uh, is sort of structured. So we had to figure out some changes and we've been working on those and hopefully we got a solution that will work um, wor work well moving forward. So I'm gonna go through some of these changes and what they're gonna be. And, uh, and then I think at that point, we can probably open it up to questions about concurrent on campus or anything else that you have out there. So let me just pull up my notes here real quick. Okay, so the first change is that prior to participating in concurrent on campus, we are going to have students and both their parents sign an MOU. Um, 
that will, I think it'll be a one-time thing, but we may have to do that. Um, I don't know, we'll have to figure out a way to manage that on the back end, just have students do that once. So students who have been participating in concurrent enrollment will have to do that, and new students will have to do that. And uh, and then we will make sure we keep that on, on record. So just to make sure that they understand all of the rules and the stipulations for participating in concurrent on campus. Uh, the second thing, and I think we've already mentioned this, but uh, we'll send out an announcement that includes this information. Uh, students who are participating in concurrent on campus will be responsible for all textbook fees and course fees that are associated with the class. And that's on top of the $5 per credit hour tuition. Um, the way that concurrent enrollment works right now is that students are not charged fees because in the high school, you bear the majority of the cost. So if a student is taking a, a um, an automotive class, they're all kind of, there's all kinds of equipment and, and supplies and everything that the student needs. And those are covered by you, the high school. And you either charge the student or for students that are on fee waiver, you, uh, you pay for that for them. So for the on-campus, since the high school is not paying for those fees, that will fall on the student to pay those. That's something that hasn't happened in the past. And if you have students that are on fee waiver that um, that are participating in on campus, then what you'll need to do is work with Becky, who will connect you with the sponsored student accounts, and they will set you up as a sponsor, and then you would be able to, to pay that student's fees, and they will send you uh, basically a receipt and, and or a bill or an invoice or whatever for those students that you wish to, uh, to pay for. Uh, there's a question, will those class fees be charged to their MySLCC account? Uh, yes, they will. So um, students will see those, those fees appear. And if they are on a fee waiver, then they'll need to talk to you. And then once you pay, you can you can talk to them and say, okay, well, well, we'll take care of this and then work with sponsored students. They'll bill you. And then once that's paid, it'll come off of the student's account and show as paid. So um, that's how fees will be handled. Because up to now, we weren't charging fees for on campus. And they were using classroom supplies, and we're like, and we said, well, who's paying for this? Nobody was paying for it, so um, it it doesn't does need to be assessed with students. So that will change for fall, uh, twenty twenty four. The next one is that the uh, so registration for concurrent on campus will open on the priority registration date, just as it has before on the SLCC academic calendar, and it will continue until the last day of the high school year. So that would be at the end of May or June for fall semester. And then it would be just prior to the winter holiday break, usually around mid-December for spring semester. And after that registration window closes, then students would not be able to request uh, registration for additional classes. The reason for that is because uh, in the current model, students request to register for a class, Becky unlocks the ability for them to do that, and then they register themselves. Because cross-listing is gone, students can no longer register themselves because um, basically they would, they would have access to every class on our campus and then they would be far, charged full tuition. So in order to address that, Becky's gonna have to register them and, and during this window, and then once that window opens, it reopens back up to all of the adult students. Um, so it's, we gotta do some like creative juggling here to make that happen. So, so basically once that window closes, then uh, so the end of, end of May, 1st of June, then there, there are no longer any other options. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about what happens if a uh, if a class is dropped. Um, but let me talk about a couple of other things here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so for a student to register for concurrent on campus, they first have to meet the qualifying criteria that are listed on the concurrent on campus website. Those are basically the same. They have to meet whatever high school requirements you have. They have to be a uh, junior or senior. And, uh, and they have to be able to demonstrate that on their high school transcript, and they have to meet any prerequisites that are required by the college. So they need to make sure that they meet those criteria. If they don't meet those criteria, then they would be dropped from the class. So it's really important that for those of you who are participating in concurrent on campus, you make sure students meet all those criteria 
before they participate in on campus. Um, next, so the process of registration is for them to register on a campus. You would do the vetting of the students and then submit a registration form for them. So we will be sending out a copy of that registration form along with the signed MOU, and you would send that through my CE, just like you've done. So instead of just a, a request to say the student wants these classes, we're going to need a signed registration form from the student because we are registering them. So we need documentation that shows that the student agreed to that, to being registered. Because we've had issues in the past where we register a student and then down the road they fail the class, they never went there and said, I didn't even know I was registered for the class. So they have to sign that registration form and we need the MOU, which we will make available. In fact, we'll have a link to it in my CE on the side there so you can access it really easily. Okay, the next one, let's see. So if the CE office verifies that the student qualifications are met, then students would be registered on a first come, first serve basis based on the timestamp of the support request. And students would be able to monitor seat availability, I believe, through their MySLCC account, although we're trying to figure that out. We may end up having to have a spreadsheet that Becky maintains that we put publicly on our website, and they can see uh, which classes are filled up and which ones are not. You'd be able to see that as well. Um, so we're trying to figure out a good system so that both you and the student can monitor that. Um, I mean, you'll be able to monitor it because when you submit that support ticket, once it's been processed, Becky will mark it as, as complete. And then uh, she'll put a note in there, the student was registered or sorry, no seats were available, the student wasn't registered. So we'll have a way for you to track that. Um, also, we're, we're gonna let students and parents know that whenever they submit those requests, so once you get that and submit it through my CE, we'll guarantee that within five to 10 business days, um, they will they will know either through um, well through you uh, or whatever system we have here that the request was processed and that they are registered in the class. So you would be right. You would be notified immediately once it's processed, and uh, and then you can let the student know. Or within five to ten business days, if they go into their MySLCC account and they don't see that they're registered they can probably safely assume that there were no seats available. So we'll, we'll work on trying to figure out a good smooth uh, system so that you and the student can track and monitor that. But right, right now what we're looking at is either they can check in my SLCC within five or 10 business days to see if they show up as registered, or they can hear that from you once you get a notification on the support request. Okay, and then the last one is that if a class is canceled, so let's say, because I mean, I mean, the deadline's gonna be uh, June, June for fall semester, the first part of June, and then mid-December for spring semester. So let's say that um, in August for fall, the academic department decides there's not enough students to carry the class, and so they cancel the class that the student was registered in. If that happens, then what will happen is that the scheduling office as soon as they get that cancellation notice from the academic department, they will uh, immediately see if they can find a couple of alternative options of the same course that the student was registered for. At It'd probably be at slightly different times. They're gonna see if they can find something within that time period, but it may be a little bit different and it may be on a different campus. Anyway, they'll identify those, those uh, alternative options. And if those work for the student, Becky will register them in the, in the class. And if they don't work, then they're just going to have to wait until the next semester to take that class. And I know that'll be frustrating for some students and parents because that happens. Um, that's just part of college. Uh, student, our adult students here try to get classes. They get dropped. They try to find an alternative. Everything's full. And that's really just the nature of, of college. So we're going to do our best to try to find a couple of alternatives. Um, but if not, they, they need to be aware that they would need to um, check next semester or look at options at the high school. In fact, one thing that we would very, very strongly encourage is that if you have the ability to offer these classes in your high school, that students take them on your high school campus, not on our campus. Really the concurrent on campus is was designed for students who don't have those opportunities in the high school um, so that they can, they can take those uh, and work towards whatever their academic plans are. 
So I think those are all the major changes for concurrent on campus. Um, is there anything else you can think of, Becky? Um, I was just going to say, as far as seeing seat availability, I'm still checking on that. Um, I wasn't able to get a hold of um, David, who is the scheduling office person that we've been in contact with. And so um, he's not available until after three. Why is my phone doing that? Because you're important. Um, yeah. Anyway, and so as soon as I can get a hold of him and get an answer as far as how you were able to see seat availability for just those those seats that they're allowing us, um, I will make sure to get you guys updated on that. So that's the other thing. Um, as far as like sending the request, I it is first come first serve, and it's going to be you know I. I I'm going to be going through them as quickly as possible. So if I come across a student that has like a small balance hold or they have anything that's preventing me from being able to register them, I'm going to have to deny it and move on to the next student. So they need to make sure that they don't have any small balance holds. They want to make sure that they have, they fulfill the prerequisites. Everything is, is in place before they send that, you send that request. Um, because if I, if, if I'm not able to register him, I, I just have to keep going um, to the next person. Becky, there's one other comment to one, one other thing that I forgot to mention, and then it looks like Chantel's got a, um, a question. And that is um, that because now managing the concurrent on campus is more of a manual process, we are going to be limiting. So before it was a random selection of classes at a whole bunch of different times at a whole bunch of different classes. And a lot of those never had a single student in them. And uh, and it was a fair amount of work to try to get those set up. Now it's even more uh, work on the scheduling offices side. So the classes will be um, offered between one o'clock PM. And I think I think it's like a one, one o'clock ish, um, give or take and then about 5.30 p.m. So in the afternoon that way, um, we were thinking that that would work better for a high school student schedule so they're not leaving at the beginning of the day or early in the day, midway through the day, and then not coming back. Um, but they can they can uh, get released from maybe their last period, make it over to our campus, take a couple of classes, and then head home. Um, and then plus, one of the things, the the whole driver behind expanding concurrent on campus. So years ago, we only had, you know, a few dozen classes that were open, and then we moved to hundreds of classes that were open. The idea was that those concurrent on campus helped to fill seats that would otherwise go empty. So we chose uh, areas where enrollments, enrollments were relatively low, so that rather than having nobody there, we could at least have a concurrent enrollment student in the class. That sort of expanded out into classes that were not like not at their like it was more of their peak times. And so we're sort of scaling that back to when are the really slow times for enrollments on our campus, which is the one to, to 530 time block. So we may see a reduction in the number of classes that are available. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that that will also be a change. And we'll see what those numbers turn out to be, um, but we'll get that information out as soon as we can. Okay, Chantel had a question. Yeah, my question is about the three requests. So in the past, they've been able to like request three open and then they can kind of see what they want to do or go for all three or go for one of the three that's open. So is that gone? Like they can just, how many can they request to register for? So they yeah, can they still can, request up to three, but I will, they, I'll be registering for those three. So if they decide they don't want to register for those classes, then we'll need to drop them. So, so. can they self-drop? Yes, they can. Okay, still that's good. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, we would prefer that they kind of make a decision on what they want before you send that. Because if you have three, you know, a student registering for three classes and they only want one, they're preventing other students from being able to take those two classes. So, oh yeah, for sure. I um, our kids actually never ha have a hard time getting into them uh -huh. at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, because I think they all in the same classes and they're late and they don't, you know, they're kind of at the tail end of the, when it closes. And yeah. so we'll just have to do our best to make sure they're, they're early as possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other great the thing... biggest thing is, is letting our students know that, that this is changing and, you know, that they need to get in early because if they, if they don't have it to us before the school year ends, that's, they're not getting in They're you know, if they can't come in in August or when classes, you know, when, when school starts in the fall and, and say, I want to take these classes on, on Salt Lake Community College's campus, because that's, it's going to be closed at that point. Well, I think with the windows that will hopefully um, resolve some of those issues. Cause we do have a lot of students that wait until the last minute there, there won't really be a last minute anymore, like earlier on. So when class is open till uh, till the end of May, there's going to be a lot more options available than when they're reaching out in July and August, trying to see what they can get. So, so are those dates hard and are those available? Because now that's different, right? Like now it's just not a normal student calendar. It's a special student concurrent on campus calendar. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, the yeah, that's right. the The open date will be the same that's listed on the calendar, but the closed date will be different. And is that listed right now? Can we get that? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. I haven't updated the website. This is hot off the press as of uh, yes, was it yesterday that I that we had the meeting? Or was Tuesday. It day Tuesday. Yeah. So as soon as the website is updated, then uh, we'll get everything updated, and then we'll send out the announcement to you all and the students and let them know. So that way, it, when you go to check the website, it's it's there. There were a couple of questions that came in through the, the chat. Becky, do you wanna take those? And you're muted. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna revisit AP scores in just a minute. And so for Rob, yes, that means that all on-campus, um, concurrent on-campus requests have to be submitted to me by the end of your school year. So um, so end of May, early June. Um, as far as AP scores, um, as I mentioned before, they are, they are entering AP test scores so that you can see, and we do have it. I'm uploading to my CE now so you can see the ones that they have entered. Um, she did mention hopefully getting them all in tomorrow. Um, I will be reaching out to her to see if there's anything I can do to help get that done tomorrow because I would really like to, the ones that we have to be in there for you guys to see. Um, as far as missing scores, if there's ones that um, have not, we have not received their AP scores, they just need to keep waiting. Um, they will not process appeals until after the, the registration deadline. So once that registration deadline comes or hits, then they can do an appeal. And then we will have to manually register them. They, they really want students to be proactive and be sending their AP scores in time to get them and register themselves. So they, they don't want to be doing appeals until that happens, you know, until they've, they've exhausted all other options. So the appeal, you will be required to, I need a registration form, signed registration, late registration form for the student. I will need um, a copy of the page of the report that goes to the high school, not the report that goes to, that's emailed to the student, but the one that goes to the high school. Um, if you have a report that has several students on that page or whatever, um, you can re redact the, the students that are not you know, being on the appeal and just, you know, or, and highlight the one that, that you're appealing for. Um, but we just need to, it has to have their name on there and it needs to have their score on there and, and the AP test that was taken. Um, and then I will need a screenshot showing that they did request to have them sent to us. If they did not have request to have those sent to us by the test benchmark, which for spring is February 2nd, um, then they do not qualify for a late registration or an appeal. So they need to make sure that they're trying to send those. Um, really, you, it, it's taking about four months for us to get AP scores. So they really should be, have sent them already, and hopefully they did. But um, it's taken about four months for those AP scores to get to us. So I just have a, I have a student who sent hers paid to rush it back in August. Mm -hmm. There's still no record of it. 
Mm-hmm. I just, I'm having a hard time with her not being able to appeal it until the 12th because mm-hmm. then she has no access to the slick canvas course, which is where teachers are supposed to be teaching their classes. So then that kid doesn't have access to her class for almost a whole month, even though she did what she needed to in August. Okay. Did you, have you sent that person to me yet? My Becky Carlson, my admin assistant has sent it and you don't have record of her. Okay. So I'm just wondering, she's our only one, but she did what she needed to do clear back in August. So has she, has she reached out to college board to find out why those aren't sent to us? I'll find out and shoot you an email. Yeah. Have her. Yeah. Okay. Have her, have There's her, no way otherwise for an appeal to happen before the deadline. There's not. Okay. No. Hey, I, I'm hoping, I, I know it's, it's a long ways away, but I'm hoping that when we start getting these electronically, which isn't going to happen until 2025, but um, some of these issues are going to be less for AP scores. Okay. So um, I know it's okay. a long ways away and we, we have yeah. to develop it for a little while, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I hope. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions about AP scores? Okay. Um, just reminders about some deadlines and um I know you guys have been checking for missing grades and that has not been possible because my CE has been down and now Banner has been down. So hopefully starting Monday, we can check for missing grades. Just, you know, remind your instructors to enter their grades in the meantime. Um, concurrent on campus deadlines. Again, just make sure they're following the academic calendar for this semester. Um, but make sure your students are aware that uh, that is changing for the registration deadlines. Um, admission deadline is February 2nd. That's also the test score and um, balance hold benchmark. So that is basically it's a benchmark. It's not a deadline. Students will still be able to register themselves if they get their test scores, like if they go in and take the placement test that following Monday and those test scores are entered that day, they'll still be able to register themselves. However, if something happens and they pay it and it doesn't, you know, that, you know, after that February 2nd date, if they, you know, pay a small balance after that date and it's not in time for registration for them to register themselves, they do not qualify. Stop. Um, they do not qualify for a late registration. So that's why it's a benchmark, not a deadline. Just make sure they're aware that if they are not able to register themselves, you know, they they can try to register, but if they, you know, it's not taken care of in time, they, they're out of luck for the semester. Um, the, de- the missions deadline is a hard deadline. They will not op- reopen the application for all of the students so that one student can go in and do a late application. So they will not be able to apply after February 2nd. They will be completely out of luck if they try to apply at um, 11.59 on February 2nd. So just make sure they're aware of that. Um, Instructor applications, all ongoing and new instructor applications are due March 31st for the following year. Um, make sure you you send those over by March 31st. I'm still getting a lot of teachers that I didn't get applications for. Um, and, and it's really hard if you send them after March 31st for me to keep track of who I have registered, who I have scheduled classes for. Um, and so we really need to get those in by March 31st. Um, if you think they're going to be ske- uh, be teaching, but you're not sure, just send an ongoing application for them because I, I would rather have that class on there and ready to go and, and cancel it later than to not have it on there. So um, if you think they're going to be teaching, please do. Anything after March 31st, we'll have to, you'll have to reach out to Brandon and ask for permission. So... Um, and he has to check with the department and make sure that the teacher has had their training, even if it's an ongoing one. He has to check with the department, make sure that they've had their their annual professional development before 
we can allow a late application. So everything needs to go through Brown Bennett after March 31st. Um, withdrawal deadline, March 22nd, that's a ways off. I'll be reminding you again about that, but just thought you guys would like to be aware of that. Um, next meeting I put down is gonna be February 22nd. I'm gonna have to move that because I will be, I'm getting surgery for February 20th. It's a simple surgery, but I will have tubes up my nose and I'm not gonna come see you guys. Um, so I can do it the week before or we can do it the week after. Um, anybody have a preference? Okay, I will just make a decision and send that out to you guys. Any other questions? Yes, Becky, uh -huh. um, this part this partly Jacobs up at Olympus. Mm -hmm. You you're aware of the ACT uh, transcript scores and transcripts that the Granite District has done. Yes, we're, yes. We're asking the um, IT people to reprogram the ACT scores with dates. The dates. But they would be. What would be listed right now, they said, is the there would be the super scores listed with the date that that score was achieved. Is that would that be sufficient to have that kind of uh, documentation for? Um, yeah. Or you can even just write the date on there and and like initial it. I really, it, it the biggest thing is is we have a lot of students that take the ACT several times a year and they don't know which ones, you know, we have and which ones we don't. And so that's their biggest issue over there is is why of why they need dates. <laughs> yeah, what what ACT does when this what we found out is if a student asks for the super scores to be sent, uh -huh. it'll show up on the sheet, but. Um, we can program, we can have our um, assessment program that will show the the score and mm -hmm. right next to it, the date of that test date where okay. that score was, where that score was achieved. Okay. So it is one line of all the super scores, but the dates of that particular uh, score would be listed there as a, as a documentation for the okay. particular date. You think that would be sufficient? I, I believe that would be sufficient. Um, if you want to send me a sample of one, I'll I'll check with our data center and make sure. But I like okay. I said I, I don't think that they're as concerned about the validity of the date. They just they, they need to know that they're not like putting in different dates for this or different scores for the same date or something weird like that. So it's really just a matter of. Um, differentiating that from another ACT test that they took. Well, that's yeah, this yeah, they would be differentiating <laughs> that because you'd see the score there yeah, instead of yeah. three or four test dates with the line scores. All yeah. the the best score to send up to the top with the date next to it, and you'd have one line mm -hmm. with the scores with the actual test date where that score was achieved. Okay. So yeah, I'll send we'll send you a sample of what. Yeah. Um, ACT does and what our we're we're struggling with our uh, IT people not being um, just uh, to, instead of they in the past they've loaded all, every score in so you you we could send it and you could yeah you could see, now it's they're, yeah they've, 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 they've changed, changed some things. things so that's why we want to just check if they I, if they think they can just put the test date of that particular score on that particular section. Yeah, and have this across so you can see um, the the best score for each area with the date. Yes. Okay. Cool. That should be fine. And I've got some chat things here. I think. Um, Leland says, let's see, April. So if a student gets AP credit, is there an automatic CE credit equivalence? So no. Um, oh.
So, yeah, on the AP on the AP credit, there isn't. Um, so once they graduate from high school, they would be they would be awarded. Yeah, you want to grab that chair. So once the, 